people as they join. Good morning. Perfect. Perfect. Quite a few people joined already and it's three minutes past ten. So um, good morning to everybody uh, and welcome to this uh, this deep dive seminar uh, and ask the expert session uh, about innovating in the cloud. Um, we're going to talk about quite a few things today, but first a little bit of housekeeping. A lot of you will have noticed that you would have joined uh, with your video off on mute, but feel free to turn it on if you want. It would just note that we uh, we are recording this session. So as long as you're comfortable with that, then stay on video. Uh, feel free to come off mute to ask questions at any time and things like that. It's quite quite a small group today, so it's not too many people. So please do feel free to uh, to ask questions as we go, or if not, at the end, we've got an Ask the Expert session, which obviously the more people that participate in that, the better. So without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, introduce the speakers, myself being one of them. I'm an Azure Solutions Specialist at Bytes. We're joined by Chris Spear, who's one of the Cloud Solutions Architects at Bytes. Um, from VMware, we're also joined by Andy Jenkins. Uh, he's the AVS Cloud Solutions Architect Leader in EMEA. And Dean Calvert, who's the Sales Specialist for AVS on VMware. Uh, and then from Harbour Solutions, we've got Nick Barron, who's the CTO. And I'll let you all introduce yourselves at the start of your sessions, uh, and you can tell us a little bit more about your roles and, and, and what you do there. So today, uh, we've uh, got it broken down into three sessions. And like I said, there's going to be an Ask the Expert session at the end. We're going to be looking, me and Chris are going to be looking at uh, how to migrate to Azure and, and sort of build roadmaps through applications looking at some of the different business cases that can be garnered from doing a full analysis of your infrastructure estate. Um, then the team from VMware are going to be doing a, a sort of overview of AVS as your VMware solution alongside how that complements a cloud strategy, a hybrid strategy, uh, and, and sort of look under the hood a little bit at that. And then from Harbour, uh, Nick's going to be talking about backup and DR in the cloud and looking at a few different options that you should consider uh, that might fall outside of some of the standard offerings that Microsoft might put on the table. So moving on. Um, yeah, so the first first session is me and Chris. Um, Chris and Chris, there's a lot of Chris's at Bytes. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about migrating to Azure. Um, so Chris, I've obviously introduced myself. I'm a solution specialist at Bytes. Uh, I, I deal with our customers to basically scope technical projects. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about what your role is as a cloud solutions architect at Bytes? Thanks, Chris. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a cloud solutions architect. Um, hopefully, most people are familiar with the, the title, but fundamentally, I help customers understand uh, their roadmap for technology adoption in cloud. Uh, so trying to understand uh, how to utilize the various technologies and approaches available in cloud to further their business goals or their technology goals. Uh, and then uh, once we've mapped that out, actually help customers actually start to implement that uh, with our internal delivery team um, over the you know, course of days, weeks or months. Perfect. Thanks for that. Like I said, for anyone who's joined late, we're happy to be interrupted. We're happy to uh, to see questions come through. If you want to come off mute and ask questions, or if you want to drop them in the chat, if it's easier. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're going to be looking at a uh, how you build a roadmap for your infrastructure, uh, how you should be analysing your workloads as part of a cloud transformation exercise, and then just touch a little bit on how that aligns to the cloud adoption framework and why you should really be looking at utilizing that to make the most of a successful cloud transformation. Um, first bit is, yeah, a little bit about the route to cloud. And uh, a lot of people will often hear the term uh, cloud is a journey <laughs> quite a lot. It's put in a lot of uh, it's put in a lot of Microsoft and it's put in a lot of Amazon marketing. And uh, you know, quite often times people will say, Cloud is a journey. It's not just about migrating stuff to somewhere else. Um, and whilst that does seem a little bit marketing-y, uh, what we really need to do is actually look at what they mean by that scratch under the surface. So 
you know, a lot of times people will be um, they'll come to us and they'll say, look, we need to migrate to the cloud. We've got this, we've got this business case to migrate to the cloud, or these are the reasons why we're migrating to the cloud. And they'll say, here's a here's an RV tools output of you know our infrastructure. How would we migrate that? And actually, what you need to do is scratch under the surface a little bit and say, well, actually, from all of these pieces of infrastructure, you know, what's actually coming with us? Is it possible to do something in maybe a different way? How does it move to the cloud? Where do we move it to in the cloud? Uh, and one thing that's fundamental for me when I'm talking to people is how can we actually make it better when you move? So you're not just moving infrastructure for infrastructure. And you're not improving your life. You're not improving your economics. You're not improving your operations. Um, and one of the one of the most common things is does it even make sense to move? You know why why should we move this? Uh, is is there a case to get rid of it? Is there a case to do something else with it? Is anyone even using it? Um, which is you know quite common when when you run through lists of infrastructure and applications. So if we look at the Azure Service Map, this is developed over time with more infrastructure as a service components and platform as a service components. And this is essentially what is a map of the Azure services. This is constantly being updated. There's constantly new products and services being brought out from it. And often what we see is people only really look at the infrastructure as a service layer when planning a migration. And so we want to do a lift and shift. Uh, here's the infrastructure as a service that we've got. And normally they're looking at two things. It's the compute and the storage element. And obviously all the networking things, people will either um, have uh, technologies that they're going to bring to cloud or they'll look to replace that with some of your native things. But it's still fundamentally infrastructure as a service that they've mapped to their data books. Um, and so with this, what we really need to do is actually have a look at if there's any more suitable things for you in the cloud to me uh, to make the most of the Azure services that are available to you. If you only have a scope your view to a few components, uh, then you're never really going to be making the most of the absolutely amazing platform that's been laid out before you with these cool tools, these great services to help improve your life. Um, and what going back to the cloud is a journey point. A lot of people will start off just understanding a few of these things. They don't really want to understand, or, or they might want to understand, but not necessarily have the have the ability to do it off the bat. But in the future, they can start looking at incorporating these into their strategy. You know, it's there at the click of a button to be able to use. Um, and so, what you want to do is be able to transform your workloads towards those kind of things as you go. So if we look at some of the six R's that we just spoke about, um, you'll notice here that there are only four R's, um, and that's because two of the R's are retire and two of them are um, retain. So retire is get rid of it, no one's using it. Retain is keep it where it is, uh, leave it in the data center, leave it, you know, leave it as it's currently running. But the rest of them, really valuable. Um, route to the cloud, one of them being rehost, i.e. lift and shift into cloud. Um, the other one being refactor, uh, that is sort of changing things as they go into cloud, maybe looking at a different platform. Rearchitect being changing the fundamental architecture of your application, which Chris will go into more in a second, uh, and then rebuild, which is effectively how do we how do we bring it down, bring it back up again to perform the same outcomes just in a different way. So Chris, I'm going to hand over to you now, whilst you can have a look deeper under the surface on some of these pathways. Uh, and, and hopefully articulate to, to some of the people on this call what kind of uh, R fits into their strategy. Fab. Thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, as Chris uh, ably uh, highlighted, you know that there's six R's. Um, two of them are, are not cloud adoption uh, R's. Uh, the other four we'll go into a little bit more detail here. So the first one is the most common one um that, that people are comfortable with they understand because it just feels like well i'm just moving my virtual machine estate and storage estate into another data center you know fundamentally uh it, it feels very similar to running things on premise uh you're not really adopting you know massive new cloud approaches uh often you're just running virtual machines in in cloud the um, there's a lot of free tooling and paid for tooling to help you rehost uh, in various ways. Um, and fundamentally, it is a good first step for most organizations, especially where you have a desire to exit a, a data center in a short amount of time. Uh, because 
as I said, you have tooling available to help you make this jump pretty quickly. Um, the uh, one good thing to remember around uh, rehosting is that it doesn't really affect your application or workload. Um, it just runs it in virtual machines in your target platform, Azure in this case. Uh, one really good thing that uh, the VMware uh, chaps will uh, discuss a little bit later is, well, you can, if you're running virtual, um, VMware estate on premise, you can just run VMs in a VMware estate in Azure. So if you have good knowledge and experience around VMware, you want to maintain good capability across um, different uh, uh, data center environments, then VMware um, uh, solution in Azure is extremely beneficial in many scenarios. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. Perfect. Just just on the rehost, Chris, do you think that is sort of one of the most common areas where um, people would rehost? Is it the skills that they've got invested in the technology that they're currently using? Maybe not necessarily to platform, but, you know, firewall technologies and, and sort of third party technologies that run in the cloud? A hundred percent. Yeah, uh, because you don't have to change anything fundamental around your workloads uh, or your approach. You don't have to really learn. You to, I mean, you have to obviously learn a, a veneer of um, uh, Azure to understand how to stitch it all together, but it's fundamentally virtual machines running in another place. Um, so yeah, it's the applications and configuration and management that you're used to on your on-premise estates. Perfect, thanks for that. There's your next slide. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, although it's zipped ahead a few. It has indeed. Uh, so the uh, second one is is refactor. Uh, so refactor is where you just take elements of a workload and switch it from running in a virtual machine to a managed platform service. So I'm, I'm hoping that most people have heard of so infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, and, and various other as a services. Uh, platform services are where the cloud provider provides a, uh, a fundamental service that you can utilize um, as part of your workload. So uh, for uh, most common example is database, right? So uh, instead of you having to run a virtual machine with Windows or Linux with some database technology installed on it and having to manage you know, uh, storage elements, making sure it's performant, making sure it's backed up, making sure it's always up to date, making sure it's always available, and maybe replicated between um, instances or even regions. Uh, those are all managed by the cloud provider and you just get to tick a box uh, for um, you know, whether you want uh, infrastructure redundancy across you know, one or more regions. Uh, you get to tick a box if you want backups. You get to have a slider to say how performant you want that instance to be. You get a slider to uh, indicate how much storage you require and at what uh, performance level. Basically, it makes uh, life a lot easier because someone else has to deal with deployment and management of the fundamental pieces that make up that service, which is just database, right? Uh, you still get access to that service to configure it to your application's needs. Uh, so for example, again, with, with a database server, you'd get to be able to create additional databases, you get to uh, define the schema, you get to define access control, uh, and um, and you would normally use the native um, technology, you know, native clients uh, for configuring those that you would normally utilize on premise. Um, that allows you to reduce your costs uh, for um, actually doing the administration of these pieces of the puzzle, uh, and it doesn't tend to uh, be a particularly difficult thing to do. Um, again, a database server is a database server. Uh, you can say, OK, right, well, uh, I've got this workload. It needs a database, needs I think, SQL Server 2012 or 2016 or whatever it is. And you can just say, OK, I need one of those. Uh, please, Microsoft, can you deploy that? And then you point your application uh, by just changing the, the connection string to point at that uh, database instance in Azure. Uh, 
Do you think, um, obviously, you know, SQL is a key part of uh, platform services. Uh, do you think often people are looking at just the cost of the infrastructure versus the cost of the platform, um, which obviously, you know, nine times out of 10 will run cheaper in Azure if you move to a platform service. But do you think there's also a business case to be made around the operational efficiencies of some of these services and the time that you might free up through uh, through not having to you know, update SQL every so often and, and the cell clusters, et cetera. A hundred percent, yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, quite often overlooked uh, that you, you go, okay, right, well, you know, this this might only take, you know, Half a day, half an hour a month of, of your time to do an update or or uh, something like that. Um, that is a cost saving. Um, that is a time saving that enables you to do something more clever instead of just tap 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 next through a bunch of updates potentially, and uh, maybe doing some testing. So yes, uh, it's really important to remember that platform service saves you time, uh, both in deployment and ongoing maintenance and administration and also uh, you get to have runtime costs quite often uh, sorry runtime cost savings as well uh, compared to running things in a vmware sorry in a vm because uh, quite often for a, for a virtual machine we very often see you know, someone has said okay well i need to seek a database uh, i'm going to configure four cores and x amount of storage x amount of ram and uh, it for uh, were, no, it will forever be that size. Uh, with a platform service, well, you can change that configuration, change the size as often as you like, pretty much. Um, so it might be that your application is I don't know, serving 2,000 people during the business hours, but overnight and at the weekends, maybe a handful of people join. Uh, so you utilize that application, in which case, well, you can massively scale down your database size during those periods potentially uh, and that obviously can lead to significant cost savings during, uh, for, for, for runtime okay perfect thanks for that chris uh, i'll move on to the next slide here which is about re-architecting so uh, my understanding of re-architecting is you know breaking it down into its components and putting it back together but i'm sure you can add a lot more context around that yeah, no, it, it, that's a fundamental um, a pr uh, way of understanding. It. Yeah, so instead of just taking a component of your workload and, and switching out for something that's basically the same, just run by someone else, uh, rearchitecting is is taking advantage of different technologies to uh, implement a specific part of your application or maybe the whole application. So typically uh, we would see you know, th there's uh, been a, a big push towards containers over the uh, last sort of five or so years. Uh, that is often not a technology that's used on premise. Uh, so potentially taking pieces of your application and moving them to containers. I mean, this is not the only example, but it's, it's a fairly common one. Um, where you say, okay, right, well, I'm going to take this containerized approach to deploying X application, and that uh, will allow me to utilize um, either Kubernetes or just container instances running in cloud instead of me having to run a virtual machine. Uh, and normally with re-architecting, it requires some effort um, rather than just you know maybe a, a, a few days of effort to um, switch from you know, SQL running in a virtual machine to SQL, SQL database service. When I say a few days, it might only be a few hours. Um, with re-architecting, you're typically looking at multiple weeks or even months uh, to, to plan, uh, to write, maybe write some code, maybe write some configuration changes, maybe uh, work with vendors um, to move forward. And I would normally consider this similar to you know, significant um, new deployment of a, a workload like a, an up uh, you know significant upgrade um you have to do a lot of planning a lot of testing and uh, some work to actually make this work yeah i think from the projects that i've worked on this is where you really start engaging with some of the developers from a business to look at how applications are put together uh, and how the code is written and i think a lot of the time it sort of speaks to the the containerization slide that is next a lot of the time uh people will be looking at you know adopting uh more DevOps practices and adopting different practices from within their business, maybe shifting to a mode two service model. Um, and realistically, you know, that's when it's a bit more time consuming. And, and normally going back to the whole uh, cloud as a journey piece that I started with, it's, it's a case of people can sometimes do this before they move to the cloud, but more often than not, 
this happens, you know, oh, I see this happening once they've moved to the cloud, they start going, OK, how do I break this down? Yes, exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, basically, you know, containerization is, is a huge movement, um, you know, especially where you are in control of the code of this workload. Um, you know, you have the ability to um, deploy uh, in, in you know, environment of your choice and uh, many of the technologies available around containerization can really help that uh, developer uh, experience and uh, improve the quality of the um, deployment process so you can do deployments more often uh, and you know, it gives you more flexibility around uh, availability and scalability uh, that you would find difficult to achieve in some cases uh, with just virtual machines. Perfect. Um, now, I, I, I know we spoke about this a little bit uh, the other day, but uh, service orientated architecture, obviously that is, you know, a lot of people will be used to running, you know, monolithic applications that are written all, all the services compiled into one application. Um, for developers, obviously, that's really important to to be able to break it down into SOA to be able to um, to be able to just focus on one specific service component of an application at a time. I suppose fundamentally, underneath that all, it's about saving time and it's about being able to iterate faster, right? Indeed, yes. Uh, you know, being able to um, have a <laughs> If it's possible to break down an application from a monolithic application to uh, SOA or microservices approach, that can really um, accelerate development because it makes lives easier for the developers. Right. You have far fewer uh, things to, to uh, no, manage. I'm on the sites thing with Greg. Um, uh, you get to have a um, richer application experience without having a lot of um, overhead for the developers to understand all of the interactions. You have a nice defined contract with the rest of the application saying, hey, this is the interface that you can use and um, I'll, I'll stick to that contract to you know, do something off the back end if you make this sort of request. It's really, really strong. It does add uh, some developer overhead. Uh, it does add some management overhead, add some admin overhead. It adds obviously infrastructure overhead, but it does accelerate the um, development uh, pipeline for applications that you're building yourselves. Thanks, Chris. So moving on a little bit, uh, you know, let's say I am, I, you know, I'm, I'm someone on this call, I'm an IT manager, um, I, uh, an architect, and I've got a list of my infrastructure. You know, I've done an RV tools output, or I've done an uh, assessment using some of the Microsoft tooling, uh, and I've got an output of all of my infrastructure. I think one of the things that uh, I'm doing quite often is looking at <clears throat> how to actually map that infrastructure to applications. I think you know it's not it's not a case anymore where one application uses one piece of infrastructure and so on and so forth. Uh, it's the case where actually applications have shared infrastructure, common infrastructure, and really what I'm looking to do is map the different interdependencies that my applications have on my infrastructure. Uh, I guess the main reason for that is to be able to create those application groups based on those dependencies so I can see which different systems are talking to each other and I can start looking at which ones have more gravity, which ones have more, more things talking to them. Uh, and that will fundamentally help me choose which service to migrate to, right? If I've got a database that has one dependency and that database is an application similar to your slide about refactor, that would be a really good candidate for moving to platform as a service because it's not going to have to unpick a load of different things. And I'm going to be able to just, you know, have a really easy migration path, assuming it's a modern version of SQL and assuming they're writing their code in a modern version of .NET, um, then it, it, you know, it will be a really good migration path. But, you know, I'm looking at a bunch of things um, and I'm saying, what service do I migrate this to? Or how would I choose which service to migrate this to? And I think, um, you know, obviously, from speaking before this call, we've come up with a list of areas that sort of you should be asking your business when you look at a workload in the cloud. So obviously, you know, we'll start with dependencies. We're looking at what systems talk to each other, uh, the number of interdependencies. Uh, can you map that to infrastructure? What are your shared services across specific workloads? So is it networking? Do they have shared monitoring? Do they have shared storage requirements uh, and things like that? Uh, then workload utilization. Um, so this could be over a time period. 
So you can see uh, how often the solution is used by people. So that, that specific workload, how often are people using it? Is it is it HR app that's used for two days at the end of the month to do, you know, JML processes and things like that? Or how many people use it? Is it, you know, hundreds of people at a time? Is it one person that uses it? Um, you know, and, and, and if it's only if it's only one person that uses it, how critical is it to your business? You know, is it even worth migrating or could you look for maybe a SaaS solution that could replace it? Because if it's only one user, you're only going to have to pay for one user license on it. Uh, but then, you know, if it is if, if it is something that is critical to the business, would it be possible to look at re-architecting it to make the most of things like scaling? You know, if you can if you can look at how something scales, you can schedule the scaling to to turn on and off during the busy periods. Uh, you know, let's say it is finance or HR or the classic applications that have these peaks and troughs to be able to actually, you know, scale it right back down when it's not being used for most of the month and then scale it up for more efficient usage towards the end of the month. Um, then resource utilization. So, you know, let's say I've got a data book with, you know, how much uh, my the name of my virtual machine, the CPU that's got allocated to it and the RAM that's got allocated to it. Um, what I need to really understand is how much of that resource does that workload consume over any given time period. Um, so, you know, if it's using hardly any of its resource over that time period and then you know, sometimes has peaks and troughs, then I want to have maybe look at re-architecting to use auto scaling, for example, if I can't predict when that's going to happen. But also what I don't want to do is migrate as is to cloud for anything lift and shift with the same amount of CPU and the same amount of RAM. If actually when we scratch under the surface, you're only using a small proportion of that because that will cost you a lot of money if you do that. Obviously, it doesn't, you know, if you if, if you've got an on-premise or if you've got a a sort of co-located VMware estate that you know it doesn't cost you any more money because you've already paid for the infrastructure that's already a sunk cost uh, it doesn't cost you to have those vms over provisioned apart from the fact that you know you're you're, you're wasting resources that could be used for other vms but if you've got nothing else to add then you know what you don't want to do is migrate that to the cloud where actually that resource will cost you money because you know you're paying for it on a consumption-based model and therefore you don't want to over consume Another thing that I'm always asking people about is how the application is actually developed. You know, do you own this application? Is it your own IP? Um, is it something that you've got developers for and you've got support teams for? Or is it something that's a third party application? Um, so obviously anything that's internally developed, you'll probably have more flexibility on the migration path. Uh, you'll have more options available to you because you can get your development team to, to break things down. Um, but, you know, anything that's third party developed, might not necessarily have the resources available to you as an organization to be able to help you break things down or they might not support it in different configurations um you know a lot of a lot of software vendors will turn around and they'll say oh we don't support it in that configuration in the cloud but we do support it in this configuration in the cloud and that might make the whole exercise of trying to work out where to migrate it to a little bit futile if they're not going to support it because obviously you want to keep your, your applications in support um, automation is, is another key area. So what automation, uh, more monitoring, what deployment tools are in place that you'd either need to replace with different cloud services or replicate it into the cloud. So what we're talking about here, let's say you've got monitoring on certain elements of your environment on-prem. It feeds back to dashboards for your, your teams to look at and to monitor. Um, when you migrate that to the cloud, is though, are, are those automation or monitoring tools uh, replicated in the cloud? Are they available for you to consume in the cloud? Or do you need to look at a new cloud service to maybe replicate some of those elements? And top and center business criticality is really important that you understand which applications are most critical to your business. So, you know, let's say we've got a list of hardware, we've mapped it to, uh, sorry, we've got a list of infrastructure, we've mapped it to applications then we've mapped the applications to business criticality. You then know fundamentally which bits of infrastructure are core to operating your business. And so you can build things like disaster recovery plans. You can build things like backup plans on a per workload basis, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but then also, you know, understanding the business criticality is important to understand the migration path, right? Some things you are happy to just migrate, test, okay, great, cut over. Other things might require more thorough testing, more white glove migration to ensure that 
you know, business disruption is minimal when you migrate. Which leads us on to some of the common oversights uh, in Azure. Um, let's let's start with redundancy and backup, which I know Nick is going to take us into in a lot more detail in a second. Um, but I think you know one of the one of the most common oversights is uh, the fact that Azure resources are not all redundant by design. I've uh, I've had a few calls with people, and I say, you know, what's your reason for wanting to explore using Azure? And they go, well, you know, Microsoft has said that when we deploy something, we're actually deploying it in three data centers and you know we wouldn't be able to purchase three data centers on our own and, and build a DR plan to, to sort of match that so we're going to make the most of Microsoft infrastructure which is correct by migrating to Azure you do have access to that infrastructure but it's incorrect that all of those resources are redundant by design you know some platform services absolutely if we look at things like storage if we look at things like SQL managed instance they'll have high availability configured into them, baked into them as a platform service. But a lot of infrastructure as a service things you'd still need to configure to be um, to be redundant, which is good in a way, but also bad. It's bad because it's an oversight. It's easy to assume things and it's easy to assume that things are highly available when they're not, which could cause more harm than good. However, my opinion on this is that actually you can use it to your advantage by looking at all of your workloads and creating that own backup and DR strategy. I think you know Chris coming from a coming from a you know let's say a, a, a um, data center world where normally your DR strategy you'd have to have all or nothing right you'd say these are my RTOs these are my RPOs and this is across the whole environment that's a sort of older way of thinking about things now we can actually look at what the workload specific needs are and hopefully through doing the process that we spoke about on the slide before you can say right these are my crown jewels these are the things that need really short recovery time objectives. Uh, this is where the important data is, and this is where data is changing all the time. Therefore, we need uh, stronger recovery point objectives and all of these. These are development boxes. Maybe we don't need them back up in 20 seconds. Um, so yeah, that's that's obviously one of the one of the things to consider when migrating to the cloud. Um, monitoring and logging. Um, I think is it audit logs for 90 days. So yeah, so uh, you know one of the one of the things that I'm speaking to customers about is. You know, I had a call with someone the other day and they said, look, I'm trying to look at what happened. It was about 120 days ago uh, on their storage accounts, how much how much storage was being consumed at a certain point in time. Um, and they couldn't find it. They, they, they couldn't find I think someone went in and changed something quite a while ago uh, and they just couldn't figure out what happened. By default, you can only monitor sort of your basic audit logs for 90 days in Azure. Um, you know, we're talking CPU, disk IOPS networks, uh, you don't get RAM um, and some of that that stuff in performance metrics, you can only monitor for 30 days. Um, so, you know, if you if you need to go back and have a look at what's happened, what you really need to do is just set up some more enhanced logging and monitoring. Chris, do you want to talk about some of the some of the tools that people can use to do that? I was just going to say that, um, you know, it, it's really, really, really key. Um, you know, I can't stress it enough. You have to think about uh, the preceding slide, you know, uh, around all those different questions you need to ask and, and understand, and these pieces on a per workload basis, and potentially even components of that workload. Uh, you know, you need to pick and choose the right level of uh, capability, scalability, performance, uh, backup, DR, HA, and logging, everything to minimize cost in cloud. If you don't do that, if you take that blanket approach that you, I often see in, in uh, on-premise environments, um, you are um, going to wildly um, be over budget in, in cloud. Um, for monitoring and logging, um, yeah, basically there's good tooling um, available as part of Azure, and some great tools uh, around log analytics for both you know, um, metrics and uh, textual logs, uh, and you can analyze at scale across your entire estate, um, but you can also use your standard on-premise approach if you would like to. So you can spin up an Elk stack or you can use System Center or, or whatever tooling you might have um, in place already today. Thanks for that. Um, cost controls, I suppose it, it is an oversight as you just mentioned, right? It's it's a thing that unless you set up proper cost governance uh, and resource allocation, it's going to be really hard to track 
why people spend keeps increasing, right? So let's say you've got an Azure environment, the spend's going up. If you've set up proper tagging and proper monitoring of your costs, you'll really easily be able to find out why it keeps going up, right? Uh, and ultimately what I say to people is you, when your cost increases, you want to make sure that you can track that to value add things, right? It's if you're an e-commerce store, you want to make sure that you can track your spend increase to sales and people visiting your website. If you're a you know local government, you want to be able to track your spend increase to you know hiring more employees and doing more work and, and, and operating more efficiently. But if you can't look into why that's happening, then it becomes a, a real head scratching exercise into it, and you sort of go, oh well, maybe 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 this cost savings in Azure weren't what uh, what they first appeared to be. Um, and I think I've, I've just mentioned here that actually, you know, a lot of people will be hearing what you just said, Chris, about, you know, doing things on a per workload basis. Um, people will have hundreds, if not, well, hundreds and hundreds of apps uh, and they'll go, oh, it's just going to take too long to do that. And I think one of the key things that people can do to actually resolve that is make the teams that are responsible for using the services and deploying the services, i.e. the technical teams and developers, uh, responsible for for the bill as well. So somehow incentivize them, make the KPI centered around um, around spend control and not overspending and avoiding waste. Uh, and it's it's really important to have some sort of cost tracking and monitoring in place that can track those people and, and build things around that. So you can actually say, look, well, you haven't wasted this much this month or you've overspent on that much that month, and therefore we can we can KPI you accordingly. Um, mentioned here networking. Um, obviously, people will be used to a centralized ingress and egress point. Uh, in Azure, every VM can have its own public IP address directly assigned. Um, obviously, you know, you've got to consider how your networking might change in Azure. It's a different kettle of fish. It's not just coming in and out of a, a set of firewalls. Um, but actually, this can be used as a great opportunity to look at using something like Hub and Spoke uh, and how you can sort of make a take a modular approach to growing your environment. Uh, lastly, here is just the status quo, and it goes back to the spend control thing. Um, if you're well, it sort of goes back to the spend control thing, because if your team is always like you might think your team will always be running the best service for your workload in Azure, but actually what we found is teams will run what they know will will run and they won't try new things in Azure. And if we go back to that service map we had at the start, there's so much in Azure that you can be trying. But if people always stick to the status quo and have a sort of set of go to services, then they'll never make savings in, you know, spend through using platform services uh, or they'll never try and break things down, um, but also never try and save any time by using platform services that, you know, you, you can obviously have high operational savings in. Largest oversight of all of them is the flexible skills that you need to operate cloud. It's, you know, it's a case of cloud is always evolving. Uh, there's new services being brought out all the time uh, and it's really hard. I know, you know, it's it's a full time job for us to keep on top of them. Um, so, you know, it's it's a case of making sure that you don't only have the right skills right now, but that you've got uh, a sort of culture of evolving the skills that you've got when operating in the cloud and, and making sure that you've got a way of continually improving how you operate cloud platforms. Chris, I'll, uh, I'll pass back over to you just quickly because I've just noticed the time um, and you can maybe talk about the cloud adoption framework. Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, so uh, cloud adoption framework is a uh, massive amount of documentation online from Microsoft around how to adopt Azure well. Uh, that's all the way from you know, thinking about going to cloud, you know, reasoning, uh, business choices, uh, how to plan uh, for success. Uh, then obviously uh, you have some capability around uh, sorry, uh, how to develop skills, how to uh, do things well. Uh, We've covered this in in fair amount of detail in a previous webinar, uh, which is available on YouTube. Uh, I'm sure Catherine uh, can uh, help um, provide a link to to attendees uh, after this uh, seminar. Uh, basically, we've absorbed it all, uh, and uh, we offer um, customers the ability to engage with us to accelerate their um, their use of you know, good practice. Uh, and uh, build out their 
cloud environment according to best practices and well and appropriately for their organization. Uh, as the previous slide said, you know, uh, there's 2000 plus pages of uh, documentation in this. Uh, it's a lot of reading, um, but there's some really golden nuggets of information in it. Um, this slide lays out, you know, the very high level principles of the cloud adoption framework. I'm not going to go into any detail uh, as they um, refer to YouTube um, or by all means get in contact with us to uh, walk you through these components uh, as they are appropriate to your organization. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, so moving on, uh, thank you for listening to our first session. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the box uh, in the chat box there. I'm now going to hand over to, uh, to Andy and Dean from VMware. Uh, they're going to talk us through Azure VMware solution, look at some considerations and well, Dean, I'll let, I'll let you guys introduce it. Um, you, you probably do it better than me. So I'm going to stop presenting for a second uh, and give you guys control. Great. Thank, thanks, Chris. And uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, delighted to be to be here. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully that will come through. Can you can you see that? OK, uh, is that coming through, Chris? Yes, I can see that. Thank you. OK, okay great. So so I guess just in terms of, of an intro, uh, Dean Calvert from VMware. I'm a sales specialist for the Azure VMware solution. And as we're going to talk about in a little bit more, more detail, it is a Microsoft sold and supported solution. So this is not a solution that VMware sell, but we do work very closely with Microsoft. So my role is to work with our uh, account teams at VMware and, and work with customers uh, to understand their, their use case and, 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 and help them uh, with, with the Azure VMware sold solution. So that's, that's, that's my role. Uh, Andy, do you want to just do a quick, uh, quick introduction? Yeah, sure. No problem at all. Thank you, Dean. And good morning, everyone. And apologies for my surroundings. Uh, I, I did want to prove that I was real and not a bot, so I have turned my uh, video on just for the introduction, just so uh, you can see who I am. I find myself stuck in a car park at the moment, so uh, uh, we're improvising with an iPad. Uh, yeah, so Andy Jenkins, I am the uh, AVS technical lead for EMEA at VMware, so I lead a small uh, team of cloud solution architects and we're responsible for working directly with Microsoft on all things AVS. My background is in Azure, so uh, I spent just over three years uh, working as a principal architect uh, in Microsoft on the Azure platform. So hopefully when we start talking about the solution architecture, I can cover it from both a native point of view and a, a VMware point of view, and I can show how, how these two worlds combine uh, to form the service. So uh, yeah, look forward to taking you through uh, the, uh, the, the service today. Uh, great, thanks, Andy. We'll let you uh, take your camera off if you want to take your camera off. Um, so, um, I, if if anybody on the call does have questions, then then feel free to come off mute and ask a question as as you go through. Andy, I'm quite happy to do that. Or if you're more comfortable to do so, just type them in the chat, and we'll try and try and address those as we go through. And 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 we will be on the on the panel session at the end as well. So that's another opportunity to uh, to to ask any questions. So I'm really just going to kind of set the scene around some of the, the the benefits, what we see as the the kind of differentiators and use cases before Andy goes into uh, into a deeper dive into the into the solution. So so to start off off with um, on on this first slide, and I think really how I kind of explain it is, is it's, it's quite simple. It is really bringing VMware and Azure together. So it brings together what we call our VMware Cloud Foundation or VCF stack and the ability to run that in, in, in Azure. So, so what that really means is it, it does give you the kind of best of both worlds. It's, it's our software in, in Azure, so you get the ability to, uh, to, to run that. Uh, we talked about the kind of refactoring in, in, in the session that the two Chris's just, just did and also lift and shift. So using this solution in a, in a lift and shift scenario, you don't need to refactor. Uh, you can move those workloads over. Uh, you've always had for, for, for some time uh, the, the Azure native VMs, and this gives you another option to be able to bring VMware in on a, on, on a VMware hypervisor and give you that, give you that flexibility. Uh, from, from a skills perspective, if within, within your organization, you've got people that understand and know VMware, it is those same skills. And Andy, I'm sure will share some of the kind of uh, screens that, that show you what that looks like but once you're running AVS in, in Azure you can use those same uh, tools and, and techniques that you would use and the interface is very familiar for you if, if you're an existing um, VMware, VMware customer and, and from an economics perspective I know, I know Chris talked a little bit around the economics but we do see that, that this 
as, as well that can help lower that, that total cost of ownership. If you look at your traditional on, on-prem environment and then moving into, into, into cloud. And, and what I'll touch on when I talk about the use cases in a second is a little bit around those economics because we often get customers that say, well, actually, I'm not interested in doing lift and shift. I'm, I'm moving on a uh, on, on, on a on refactoring or, or re-architecting. But we very much do see this as kind of kind of complementary. And and, I'll, and as I say, I'll touch on that on some of the use cases. But really, if you're on that journey to to to, to go to native, then and you still have a, an existing kind of VMware, let's say, legacy footprint, how do you manage that? How do you get that data gravity into Azure and leverage the services? And this is is, is a very quick route to, to be able to do that. So, so the, the the next slide here is just talking a little bit around the the differentiation of of, of, of AVS, and I guess this is some of this is differentiation against other cloud services that that, that are in the market. So, if you look at um, the, the first one, which is a, a kind of business different uh, differentiation, this is uh, lower cost for Microsoft applications. So, because AVS is an Azure first party service, it does get the benefits of uh, that, that you would get from Azure, such as uh, the free extended support um, for Windows 2008, and also the ability to bring your existing on-prem Windows and SQL licenses. So for quite a few of the customers that Andy have spoken to that are either looking at this or have started on that journey, that's been a kind of lever, if you want, that, that's helped them make the business case and say, actually, we're going to bring some real cost savings here by, 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 by making, making that move. So the uh, in Microsoft terminology, the ESU, extended support, um, that, that, that would be... Uh, uh, would, would, would be part of this service. So, so that can often help make the uh, make the business justification. Um, from an operations uh, perspective, I, I touched on, on on the previous slide around, it's the same um, VMware to, to VMware technology, but also you've got unified consumption and billing. So this would all be billed under, under Azure. And, and that best of both worlds means that along with configuring and managing this from a VMware toolset perspective, you can also bring it into, into ARM and start to manage it from ARM along with the billing as well. So from an operational perspective, uh, you get you get that you get that link. And then um, again, I touched on the, the, the kind of lift and shift use case and, and what customers are looking to do, but by accelerating that journey of bringing those VMware workloads into Azure, it does mean then, then you can start to get access to that Azure marketplace and, and looking at uh, a hybrid model where you can start to leverage PaaS services where perhaps your data gravity is on VMware platforms that might take longer to actually um, uh, uh, re-architect re or, 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 or refactor. Um, the, the, the two boxes on, or the box on the right there just shows that potentially you, you're looking at a 75% lower cost for Windows on SQL 2008, and, and that, that's a lower cost than if you were to put this in a in another cloud. And through the bring your own license again, which is an Azure uh, benefit. There are cost savings there from having to to to, to repurpose, uh, repurchase those licenses uh, in another in another cloud model. So, and Andy, any any other comments before I just move on to some of the the use cases that we see? No, so I think you, I think you covered it really well there, Dean. I, th I think the big thing for me as as a cloud solution architect is it, it is just a first party Microsoft service. You consume it in the same way you create an Azure VM in the same way you create a VNet, you just create the AVS service. And as you've alluded to on the billing, it just bills to your existing Microsoft uh, EA or CSP agreement. So uh, from a cloud solution architecture point of view, it, it's based on ARM and you just deploy it like you do any other Azure cloud service. And, and that's the power of the service to me is that uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic tool to have in your kit bag when you're trying to accelerate a cloud journey and you've got lots of applications on premise where you're debating the value of refactor re-architect there's an issue with trying to get the line of business to approve it avs as you've highlighted just cuts through it cuts through a lot of those challenges and just allows you to get on uh, and move stuff at pace Great, thanks, Andy. Um, so, so just to touch on some of the use cases that we see from 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 customers. So, so uh, we and I know some of this touches on what we what's already been talked about on, on the call. Uh, but that application modernization, that proximity to to Azure services, uh, we definitely see customers that are building or have built new services, but the kind of data gravity of those legacy systems is still on premise, and that quite often slows down then their, their ability to move to the next phase of that. 
Whereas if they can lift and shift those workloads onto that Azure backbone and, and do it quickly, uh, they can start to drive that modernization uh, quicker and, um, and, and, and more, more efficiently. Uh, the second one, the data center footprint reduction or exit, we do see customers and, and, and we've got a number of customers that have used this for a, for a DC exit and really to accelerate that, that exit. So, so, so again, in some cases, they were looking at a, a modernization and, 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 and leaving that, that DC, but they just couldn't get there, get there fast enough. And, and this can really help you uh, do that exit and do that exit exit quicker. And, and, and again, if customers have maybe done 50 or 60 percent of that, of that journey to, to modernize, but there's still 40% of workloads left behind, then they've still got all the overhead and the cost. And, and like I think Chris Chris mentioned it himself, like if you're not really sweating those assets, maybe there's not additional cost there, but they're, they're assets that you're not, not, not leveraging on site. And at some point they're going to come up to be to be refreshed. Uh, you've got data center cost and all the costs of managing that. So this can really kind of accelerate that 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 final kind of kind of exit. The, the DC expansion, again, is a good uh, use case. Some of our customers are looking at saying, well, actually, we do want to get into the cloud, but we're not quite ready to make that kind of uh, full, journey, full journey yet and start to and start to modernize. That's probably going to be 6, 12, 18 months, 24 months down the line. But in the meantime, what we don't want to do is, is have a sunk cost to buy uh, new hardware and infrastructure, because if we do that, it's gonna we're gonna have to sweat it for three to five years. So that's gonna put our plans behind. So quite often we'll see that they'll use that as an expansion to say rather than buy new infrastructure, we'll expand into, we'll extend our DC into this, um, and that will give us a footprint to, to move forward. And, and and you can see some of the other kind of uh, use cases there, things like temporary events, uh, regional expansion. Um, acquisitions is a good use case that we've seen recently with with another customer. They'd already built an Azure landing zone, and they wanted to uh, to, to build a, a effectively a kind of a, a VMware landing zone, if you want, as well, because they knew that we're going to be acquiring companies, and that gave them that platform to to expand and quickly uh, bring in those uh, those th th those workloads. Uh, there's also a, a desktop virtu virtualization in the cloud that can that can run on um, on, on on AVS. And, and also DR in the cloud as, as, as well. So looking at that whole kind of DR capability, uh, how can AVS help you with that? Um, either to, 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 to bring some of those, give, give protection to some of those workloads, or even we've seen customers that will actually go primary in the cloud and, and, and use on-premise as, um, as, 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 as a backup and, and, and the modernize, modernize in the cloud. So, so that's a kind of overview of some of the use cases that, 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 that we see. Um, Again, any questions, then then feel free if you want to come off mute and ask questions now or, or, or type them in the chat. Uh, but with that, I'm going to hand, hand over to Andy, who's going to go a little bit more deeper into the solution. So, uh, Andy, any, any final comments on the use cases before we go into the deeper dive? Uh, yeah, thank you, Dean. So I think the only thing I would add, based on the experience of what we've seen, you know, our roles cover the whole of EMEA. So if I was to sort of place these into what we're seeing most and try and rank them a little bit to give people a feel. So I'd say our predominant two use cases right now are data center expansion and DC exit. Uh, because AVS is now reaching a level of maturity, people are thinking much more about DR. So whether that's on-premise into AVS as DR or AVS to AVS as DR, that use case is really growing. And we're speaking to lots more customers about DR. And then, the two that are sort of emerging are customers that have Horizon, uh, uh, Horizon Desktop on-prem and want to extend. Uh, and as you said, that data gravity, that app modernization play, getting those apps close to the data, we, we see that as well. But the, the predominant two, uh, would be, I'd say, with DC expansion, DC exit. And, and as you see in the text below it, there's a whole raft of reasons why, why people are uh, using those two use cases at the moment. Hi, Cindy. Cool. OK, thank you, Dean. So, yeah, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time now looking at the uh, technical architecture, because I, I think as we speak to customers about the AVS solution, we say it's a first party Azure service. We often get asked lots of questions. Well, how do you actually integrate into Azure? What does that mean? And hopefully as I go through the next few slides, I'll be able to articulate exactly how AVS fits into uh, the Azure ecosystem. So. I typically start uh, by doing this sort of level set just to get everyone onto the same page. And as we've alluded to, AVS is a Microsoft first party service. So that essentially means VMware do not sell the service. It is sold 
uh, operated, architected, life cycle managed, roadmap owned, all by Microsoft. And we as VMware validate that work and people like me and Dean, we sort of work as, with Microsoft as a, an extension of their sort of uh, global black belt team, their CSU uh, cloud solution or customer success unit with their CSAs and also in the specialist technical unit as well. So, so we are an extension of that to help drive this solution. As Dean says, it runs what we call software defined data center in Azure and it runs that on dedicated Azure hosts. So for those on the call that are familiar with Azure, you, you might be familiar with this concept of Azure dedicated host. That's essentially the hardware in which the SBDC runs, and that hardware is single tenanted just for you as a customer. So you're not sharing it with anyone else. It's that deployment that you make is purely for you. Uh, it is fully lifecycle managed. So the patching, the updating, that is all provided to you by Microsoft as part of the service. So in essence, the service is an evergreen service. So as long as you have it deployed and there are patches and there are updates, Microsoft will do that in an automated, non-disruptive way. It has complete operational consistency. So one of the things I talk about is choice. So if you're coming at this solution from, from an on-premise mindset with vCenter and the VMware ecosystem, you can bring all that ecosystem to AVS. So if you're a vRealize operations customer or a vRealize automation customer, you can bring that. If you use Site Recovery Manager, you, know, you, you can utilize that technology. Vi uh, on, on the opposite side, if, you, if you're more of a cloud solution architect coming at, the, coming at it from an Azure point of view, it's integrated into the Azure portal. It's integrated into ARM, Azure Resource Manager. So you can deploy the service with an ARM template or you can deploy the service via the Azure command line interface. So you can really write this into your infrastructure as code workflow, whichever side of the fence you sit, uh, and we give you the choice to, uh, uh, to operate however you want to operate. Uh, it's also, uh, in a, it, we're in 17 Azure regions and we'll go into more detail, but we are in a subset of all the Azure regions globally and we do get direct backbone access to Azure services uh, in the region in which we deploy. And I'll talk a little bit more in coming slides why, why that's important. So in terms of where we are globally, uh, we are in what in, in all the key what what Microsoft refer to as hero regions, so sort of, sort of the uh, major DCs. So uh, currently uh, across uh, 17 regions right now, uh, we do expect further expansion in uh, Europe uh, as as this year progresses. So I have to be careful sometimes because it's a Microsoft roadmap, and I I have to be careful not to over communicate on Microsoft's roadmap. Uh, but, but I would expect to see certainly some of the larger countries in Europe uh, receive uh, the AVS services uh, later on this year. But for an EMEA perspective today, we're in North Europe, West Europe, UK, West, UK, South, uh, and we have all the major hero regions across America's covered uh, with further regional rollouts uh, planned as well for this half. Thank you, Dean. Next slide. So if we start dropping down into a bit more of the technical detail now uh, I, I try and bring to life what the deployment actually means and how this works uh, in Azure so when you deploy AVS uh, it deploys into an, a resource group in a subscription just like any other Azure service so in terms of a provisioning flow if you go into the Azure portal uh, and, and search for Azure VMware solution you'll be presented with three or four questions around the subscription, the resource group, the node type, how many hosts you want, as well as providing a network address space. Once you've done that, the service will deploy into that resource group and deployment time takes between two and four hours. So the quickest I've seen it is about one hour 45 and the slowest I've seen it is just shy of four hours. So, so there is a bit of variation in deployment, but once deployment is done, you have got a fully production ready software defined data center uh, that, that's ready to, to host production workload. We can also flexibly 
grow and shrink that environment as well. So if you need to add additional AVS nodes into your cluster, provisioning time takes about 20 minutes and to remove a node again takes about 20 minutes. The entry level for the service, so the smallest, the smallest size deployment you can do right now is uh, three nodes. So we start uh, with three nodes uh, and that is our entry point for the service. Now, I mentioned earlier that when you deploy AVS, you get access to all the Azure native services in the region that you deploy into. Now, the way in which it manifests itself is uh, through this DMSEE -E here, so a dedicated Microsoft Edge router. And essentially what that does is when we deploy it, uh, we get access to this uh, Edge router in the region we're in, and we can then connect to any Azure service that supports the VNet construct. So uh, obviously anything that's IaaS related, as was shown earlier on, on the sort of the diagram of all the services. But the good news here is we can also connect to any PaaS service that supports either service endpoint or private link. So any PaaS service you can connect to a VNet, we can connect to. Now, the reason I find that important and interesting as an architect is that allows me to do some interesting things. So the first thing is we can, if your use case is data center exit and you need to be at the data center quickly, we can do that at great velocity. And what we mean by that is we can move the workloads without changing IP address. We can do it live without any downtime and we can exit a facility quickly and into AVS. Now, if your cloud strategy is then to uh, refactor, re-architect and take advantage of native services, we can do that through AVS as well. So we could perhaps refresh our data tier, so perhaps move our SQL Server 2008 and replace it with SQL Managed Instance. Or we could retire our legacy IIS servers and replace them with an Azure app service. And what this does is it allows us to refactor and re-architect, but not doing a full refactor and re-architect, and we keep the existing, in many cases, we'll keep the existing licensing model that you would have for VMware because it's still sitting on a, on, on a VMware platform. So for some applications where you may have a problem moving it to the cloud just because the ISV licensing model for cloud is cost prohibitive, AVS makes sense that we can take advantage of that. So, so this, this, this concept of a hybrid, hybrid application deployment pattern is something that we're very passionate about promoting to our customers and, and, and showing the benefits of. Uh, next slide, please. Dave. Now, in terms of being able to deploy AVS, uh, there are a small number of technical prerequisites. Uh, so I think it's always good to call these out to folks. So if you wanted to deploy AVS this afternoon, uh, there's a few things that we'd have to do. So the first thing is you would need to have an Azure subscription that was either an EA or a CSP subscription. And like any other larger Azure virtual machine size, you would also need to request quota for AVS. So uh, typically what you would do is you would register the resource provider and then you would uh, raise the SR for quota. That takes between 12 and 24 hours. I mentioned earlier, we need to be in a resource group in a subscription. And you do need quite an elevated privilege to deploy the service itself. So you do need to be a subscription contributor to actually deploy AVS. But once the service is deployed, we then fall back to the usual RBAC roles, the role-based access control, uh, and we can manage individual users and we can limit their access to the service. And then finally, we do need uh, a, a, a private address space to deploy AVS. And you see on the screen here, we've got two slash 24s and a slash 22. We typically ask customers for a slash 21 because that just makes fit life easier. And that address space has to be non-overlapping. So what I mean by that is we don't want to reuse any IP addresses that you might be using on premise or you might be using in your, in your VNet construct. And as long as we do that, that allows us the flexibility to move workloads between on-premise and AVS and AVS and, 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 and Azure itself. 
Now, in order to take advantage of things like moving workloads from on-premise with zero downtime, no change of IP, we do need to implement some firewall changes on-premise to allow that functionality to work. And finally, you do need a connection between on-premise and Azure in order to provide a transport layer for us to move the traffic across. That has to be an express route circuit or a site-to-site -site VPN and shortly coming into, into the service SD-WAN as well. So we think with express route VPN and SD-WAN, we've got all bases covered from a, a, a transport layer point of view. The next slide, Dean. Cool. Now, in terms of the nodes, so I've said that it's three nodes, and it's really easy at the moment because there is just one node type. It's an AV36, and each node has 506 gig of RAM. Uh, it's uh, 36 cores when you enable hyperthread in, and it's around about 10 terabytes usable storage once you've applied your fault tolerance and compression settings. And the first node uh, in the three uh, that has 50 gig. Uh, reserved memory for the management uh, appliances, so like the vSAN, the NSX manager, and so on, uh, but the rest of the memory is available too. So if you just transition that on for me, please, Dean. And so what you see is that because this is uh, a HCI, a hyper-converged stack, as you grow nodes, you grow both CPU, RAM, and storage, and you know the, the chart here just gives you an indication of how that scale uh, takes place. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, one of the questions we often get asked is, well, what is the storage platform? What is the networking stack that you use? And the storage platform we use is vSAN. Uh, so it's, it's vSAN, as you would expect on-premise, and all the functionality of vSAN that you get on-premise is there. The two questions I always get asked <laughs> uh, is, is my data encrypted at rest? And is my data encrypted in transport? Uh, and the answer to those is yes. Uh, we use the latest 256-bit encryption uh, in transit. And we use Microsoft Managed Keys right now uh, for the data at rest. But we currently, Microsoft currently, so if you know Microsoft, how they release products, they tend to go private preview, public preview, and then GA. Uh, in private preview at the moment, we do have customer managed keys. So if you want to bring your own key, and that's absolutely a mandated requirement for your enterprise, then yes, we do have that in private preview right now. Uh, so next slide, please. And we do have lots of integrations into Azure storage services. So when we think, as you're going through your six R's, as we talked about earlier, when you're considering the refactor, rehost, rearchitect bits, and we're thinking about AVS, it's absolutely right to think about it on a workload by workload basis. And what I mean by that is that if you identify an on-prem workload that perhaps has, I don't know, 20 terabytes of uh, archive data in it, you know, it wouldn't make sense to bring that and use the vSAN storage just for that archive data. But the good news here is we have lots of integrations with storage services in Azure. So, you know, we, we could put it into a blob store. We could take advantage of Azure files or file sync or, or NetApp files. And just in the last couple of weeks, the Azure disk pool feature has now gone into preview. And what that will allow us to do, that will allow us to start expanding at the data store level as opposed to at the VM level. And that will allow us to start thinking about scaling the storage independently of the nodes. So if your workload is storage bound and you don't want to buy 20 nodes to get the storage, because actually you could run it on six nodes, things like disk pools will give us that flexibility to have that independent scaling. So it's going to be some time off before we see it in production but you get the idea of where we're going with these integrations. Okay, networking. So how do we provide networking? And uh, the good news here, again, is just using VMware's NSXT uh, software. Now, I get two reactions when I mention NSXT. So the first reaction is, oh, fantastic. I get access to the NSXT manager and I get to play with it all and I'm in complete control of that. And the other reaction is, oh, I'm a little bit nervous. 
I've never really touched NSXT. I don't understand it. It sounds complicated, and I'm a bit uncomfortable that that's in your solution. Now, the good news if you fall into the latter camp, and, and that's typically your cloud solution architects who, who perhaps haven't looked at the VMware networking stack, is we expose all the core functionality that you need for NSXT directly into the Azure portal. So if you need to create a network segment, you can do that in the Azure portal. If you need to set up DNS and DCHP for NSX, all that functionality is surfaced into the Azure portal. So if you're in the camp that you're a little bit shy with it, don't worry. <laughs> the stuff you need to use AVS is all in the Azure portal. And if you're coming at it from more of a, a VMware point of view, then yes, you get full access to the NSXT portal uh, and, and you can create your segments, your uh, firewall rules, all the things you can do with NSX is available to you. The only thing you can't do, uh, and this will make sense for people that perhaps understand the sort of uh, software defined networking architecture of NSX, is you do not have access to change policies and uh, uh, and, and change the settings of, of the tier zero. So, so essentially the egress route out of the network, you can't edit that, but anything below that, what we call tier one, you have complete access. The next slide, Dean. So uh, this slide sort of shows how this all hangs together. But if we move on to the next slide, Dean, it, we sort of have a build out of how this works. So, so if we sort of take it step by step, uh, this will help us to work out what's going on. So on the right hand side, you see an Azure region and you've got your Azure services in your Azure subscription. On the left, you've got your on-prem data center and you've got your edge router to egress out of your data center. Now, if we take AVS out of the equation, you still need to connect to your Azure native services. So if you just follow it on a little bit, Dean. So what you do typically is you use an express route and that express route uh, terminates uh, in a peering location. So it doesn't terminate, it's hosted in a peering location. And then what that edge router does at the front end, it then terminates on a VNet construct. So Dean, if you just move that on. And the way it does that is it terminates on a VNet. And what you do is you create a VNet in Azure. You create what's called a virtual network gateway. You set that as an express route gateway. And, 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 and this traffic is all nicely set up and, and there's lots of things you can do here, of course. So I'm, I'm sort of uh, uh, keeping it a little bit too simplistic, but yeah, lots of things you can do, but you've now got your connectivity established between on-premise and Azure. Now, I mentioned earlier was the cloud adoption framework and the cloud adoption framework will, will go into great detail on the concept of landing zones. And there's different ways and different best practices for setting this up. But what was mentioned was hub spoke. And hub spoke essentially means that you have a hub subscription where you keep all your shared services. So you, where you terminate your express route, you might have an AD server running as IaaS. You might have some backup infrastructure that typically goes into your shared, your hub subscription. And then depending on how you break it down, you can do it by line of business, technology platform, geography. You then create sub uh, spoke subscriptions, which then connect into the hub. AVS fits that model perfectly. So, you know, we typically deploy AVS as a spoke to a hub subscription. And so when you deploy AVS, uh, you get the VMware stack with the micro, uh, with the VMware uh, networking. And if you roll that on a little bit, Dean, it connects to that backend express route circuit that I spoke about. And then what we do to bring those worlds together, we then advertise VNets directly to that backend circuit. And if we then want to connect back onto pre on premise, we use global reach. And then we have choices on where we egress traffic out. So if we just move the animation on and just continue that for me, Dean. Uh, so you can see here, we have choice in terms of where we want to egress things in and out. So uh, I mentioned that hub subscription. So some customers uh, would like to uh, use what's called a network virtual appliance. Uh, and they want all their traffic inspected in the network virtual appliance. Uh, we can egress our traffic out of NSX into the hub, into the MVA, and you can egress out to the internet directly through your MVA, or you can, you can allow NSX to do all that work and you can egress directly out of AVS as well. But the point being again, is this concept of choice. You know, We want to be as fully integrated into Azure as possible. Uh, and depending on your design pattern, 
based on your best practice from from your learnings from 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 the cloud adoption framework we can fit into that model so complete flexibility just the last thing to call out on on, on the network design is people often say well we don't have vsan we don't have nsx on premise don't worry uh, we don't need to have those on premise uh, it's just how the AVS service operates, but they aren't a prerequisite to have on-premise. Uh, we also speak to some customers who don't have express routes, uh, either through maturity, so they're just not ready to invest in express routes, or they've made a decision that actually I can create a 10 gigabit site-to-site uh, -site VPN. Do I really need express routes at this stage? So they go down a site-to-site -site VPN route. Or something we're seeing more of is customers adopting SD-WAN between on-premise and, and Azure. And we can handle those deployment patterns as well. Uh, we just use an Azure technology called V1 Hub, or soon to be independent of V1 Hub, uh, uh, Azure Root Server. Uh, and we can handle that. Now, it says here non-production, uh, and, and that's strictly true today to an extent. So we will allow side to side and uh, SD1 through an exception process today, but in the not too distant future, certainly by the end of certainly by the end of Q3 of this calendar year, uh, we expect that support to be mainstream and that'll just be production uh, for, for all three deployment patterns. Next slide, please. Dave. OK, so I mentioned that you can actually move your workload. Uh, without changing IP address and without having to do any refactoring and re-architecting. So we often get asked, well, how do you manage that? What do you do there? And the tool that we use, and this is bundled as part of the service, is, is a tool called HCX. And essentially what HCX does is it installs into your on-prem uh, vCenter and uh, we establish what's called a service mesh between on-prem and Azure. And once we have that established, we have a number of migration options. So if you just move that on for me, Dean. Uh, so typically, yeah, we, we, you can move on one more, thank you. So we typically have two migration approaches. One is we call one we call a stretch layer two network, and the other is what we call a new network segment layer three network. So with a stretch layer two network, you can absolutely stretch a network from on-premise using HCX into AVS, and you can move workloads across that stretch network using vMotion technology with the same IP address without changing anything. So, so absolutely, you can do that. Now, with the tool HCX Advanced, which ships as default with the service, uh, you can do that one at a time. So you can do that a virtual machine at a time if you want to do a stretch layer two network. Or if you want to create a new network segment in Azure, we can do something called bulk migrate. And um, bulk migrate, essentially, uh, you say, right, I'm going to move these 30 virtual machines and it'll start the replication on a Monday. You get to your change window on a Sunday. You turn the virtual machines off. They then get QS, and the remaining data gets flushed. It comes up on AVS. You power it up on the new network segments on AVS, and everything's moved. Now, that does require a new IP address because we've put it onto a new network segment, but you can orchestrate that as part of the move using HCX. And so we have lots of large global customers that are doing just that. Now, you can also get HCX Enterprise, and that just brings what I've described uh, and it does that on steroids, essentially. So the first thing is you can now do parallel vMotion. So you can move multiple virtual machines at the same time across that stretch network, and, and you can do that without any downtime. And we also have something called replicated assisted vMotion. So that brings the concept of vMotion and the bulk migrate together. So as I articulated that we do the bulk migrate and we move everything over the week and then we shut the VM off to move it, with replicated assisted vMotion, instead of turning the VM off when we do the changeover, we literally vMotion that workload over without any downtime to the, to the end user. So we have lots of customers that do bulk, bulk migrate because they like the change control aspect of it and they can control it. And we have lots of customers that just like the fact that they can just get out quickly and stretch their networks. Cool.
And um, okay, just, so... just time, so maybe we can skip through um, and, and uh, some of these a little bit as well, just in, in terms of timing, and then we can always take questions during this. Sure. Or during, so. I was just going to suggest, if you can just go to the support slide, because I'd just like to close it on the support slide, if that's okay. Sure. So I think that's important just to call out. Thank you. So, uh, so in summary then, and, and I appreciate your patience in listening to me this morning, is, is we think we sort of badge AVS as managed IaaS. And what I mean by that is, as I said earlier, Microsoft will do the lifecycle management, they'll do the base configuration, they'll do all the deployments. You as an end user are responsible for configuring your network, setting up your identity provider, and then anything that sits above the operating system, that's your responsibility. So how you back it up, and we're gonna learn more about some of the backup options next, but how you back it up, how you do HA, how you do DR, how you do encryption, that's still the responsibility of you, but that core infrastructure, that's provided directly by Microsoft. So in terms of support, if you need support for the service, it's done through Microsoft. So if you've got a technical account manager uh, or you do it through the Azure portal, you can do that directly. And we now have lots of resources to find out more about AVS. So again, if you're familiar with, with, with Azure, there's a concept called Microsoft Learn, and we have a whole curriculum on Microsoft Learn uh, dedicated to AVS. I think it's a six hour course, and that's a great way to find out more. Uh, we also have a number of uh, labs where you can test this out to prove and, and, and get that around your head. So we have that on our VMware hands-on labs. And we, we both VMware and Microsoft were actively contributing to our AVS documentation on Microsoft Docs. That's changing on an almost daily basis with new content, new solutions, new integrations. So highly recommend that you uh, take a look at those as well. So with that, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and Chris, I'll just briefly hand back to you before we introduce Nick. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And, and that was uh, hopefully extremely useful for some of the people on the call who are um, potentially looking at rehost as a strategy, either due to um, maybe needing to get out of the data center and some of the other business cases that you put forward. So yeah, um, Nick, over to you. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Obviously, we work quite closely together, but um, but yeah, I'll let you introduce yourself to the group and, and then speak a little bit about some uh, backup and VR options as people move to the cloud. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Chris. So yeah, we. Uh, my name is Nick Barron. I'm CTO here at, at Harbor Solutions. We uh, we're a channel centric um, disaster recovery and backup specialist. So we use a number of different technologies uh, to to do that, and we work exclusively through. Um, partners like Bytes, and Bytes are one of our top partners actually in the space, and we have seen probably the biggest growth uh, we've ever seen really uh, over the last 12 months in terms of people looking uh, at backup and, and disaster recovery, and a lot of that has been driven by um, cloud migrations, by moving where workloads sit, uh, and obviously the underlying view of, of ransomware, which is kind of one of the big concerns I think a lot of uh, a lot of our customers have. So um, just as a sort of, I guess, a bit of a background, I haven't done any slides because I didn't want to jump into any vendor specific messaging uh, here. This was really looking at, you know, kind of covering off all the points really that everyone's already discussed as, as we've gone through here. You know, customers, our customers data is now probably more distributed than it's ever been, right? So we've got infrastructure sat on premise in, in more traditional VMware environments. And you know, despite I guess everyone's warnings that uh, that those are uh, those are dead, I think the demise is probably a little bit overstated. We certainly see large on-prem environments still being a part, regardless of a customer's cloud journey. So that they are there and they will continue to be there certainly for the foreseeable future. We've got you know some of the Azure native IaaS as uh, services like 365, uh, obviously in there. You know, 365 is in a massive uptake over the last what, 10 years really but uh, over the last sort of um, 18 months with the sort of explosion of teams usage and you know i think if we were 18 months ago we wouldn't have been doing this on teams but you know now it's a, a bit of a no a no-brainer that that's what you're going to use and i think you know just our internal organization how we share with our partners teams has become a lot more uh, than just a conferencing suite it's where we share information it's where we share documents it's 
how we how we start to communicate as an organization. So there's now more information in teams that we might want to think about how we protect. And then obviously with uh, with AVS and just the sort of general explosion of say in different places you're going to be putting your data. Um, backup and protection of that data is now sort of more important than ever because data is more valuable than ever and, and arguably more complicated than ever because at one point, you know, 10 years ago, well, everything was in my data center or maybe in a hosted data center. At least I could go and find my data center manager and ask him what he was doing for, uh, for looking after my data. Now, uh, if I just go and talk to our own infrastructure guys, they'll know a bit about what they're doing, but then I need to go and talk to my engineering team to find out what are they doing with the development stuff and what have we got in Amazon and Azure is, is where we use a, a lot of our infrastructure as well. And then Salesforce, as I say, all of these different applications all have data and all really important. So we're seeing the, the need to have a holistic backup strategy is, is key across our, our, our clients and our customers. And the need for that to have a strong center around Azure technologies, uh, be they uh, sort of Azure native with IaaS or some of the PaaS offerings, or be they things like ABS, that's um, absolutely the direction people want to go and, and, and where we're seeing our clients sort of move towards. So what do we do about it? How do we help? Well, you know, we work with, uh, with our clients and with Bytes um, to look at, different technologies. So realistically, we use uh, Convol and Rubrik as our sort of two core enterprise technologies, both of which are, are supported on, on ABS, which is good, as well as a number of uh, obviously more traditional Azure IaaS elements. Um, we see um, things like uh, Druva and uh, obviously both Rubrik and, and Convol from a 365 protection element, uh, really being a bit of a de facto standard across that. And then DR elements, all of those technologies have elements for DR in there as well. Uh, but we have technologies like Zerto, which uh, I know, not giving the game away here, but certainly is in conversations with uh, with VMware and Microsoft around how uh, how ABS will be supported with that, but is supported on, on Azure native at the minute. And obviously for VMware on-premise. So, you know, we kind of see all of those technologies start to play a mix. Uh, quite often we see more than one technology um, being used in, in our customers' environments. Uh, and then our managed service wrap then helps to control some of that as well. Again, backup is not necessarily the most exciting thing. It's one of those things that's uh, not really thought about and until the uh, uh, until stuff hits the proverbial. Uh, and then at that point, you know, suddenly everyone's demanding to know why a backup job didn't run six months ago. And it's quite difficult to go back in time and fix a problem that happened six months ago. So it's it's how can we help our clients manage, ensure that data protection is there, ensure the right technology is in at the beginning. Um, and that's probably one of the points. I know some of the slides uh, much earlier on were talking about the need to look at landing zones, to look at how do you build out a design, an architect? How do you choose what technology to use? Um, and we've seen a maturity really over the last two years coming into that space. So if I went back three, four, five years, people were rolling into Azure and they were probably typically fairly small projects and they were largely going, well, let's we'll throw some stuff in IaaS and look, Microsoft's got a, a relatively compelling product in, in Azure backup. We'll just tick that box and we'll use Azure. All is good or, or ASR for disaster recovery, uh, let's say in, into Azure. And those are, are, are both great products and still absolutely relevant today. And we, again, use those as part of our, our product, our armory uh, into what we're doing with customers. But they have certain use cases, much like on-prem, not every product sits every use case. You know, you've got some stuff that works really well in a small volume, other stuff that if you've got hundreds or thousands of VMs just doesn't scale. All of that applies to, to, to the public cloud as well. So. Uh, and, and again, some of the comments earlier on is there's a lot of assumptions in public cloud. Oh, Microsoft's going to look after my data, right? They're definitely backing it up, definitely replicating it, definitely providing DR. Well, they may well be for some services, but they're certainly not for others. So that is really key to understand at the design, at the, at the development stage, what and how do you want to use? Because if you make a wrong decision there, it just gets harder to unpick it, harder to... Um, reverse out of that decision the further down the line you get. And because the cloud um, brings so many advantages, you will end up using it probably a lot more than you think. And so those small little deployments that you're 
just throwing into Azure. We've got one client, one of our advice clients at the minute, uh, that has been using a bunch of those uh, native Azure tools. They're now spending um, a lot of money a month on that, and we're trying to work with them on how we can replace that and look at a different technology to reduce the cost is one option, but also uh, to improve the, the level of service they're getting. So all I would say, just echo kind of everyone else on, on this call's point, please understand, think, and, and architect what you're doing in that public cloud to begin with. Think about data protection uh, at, at the early days in much the same way as you would in your data center. You wouldn't just install the, the, uh, the, the backup product that HPE or Dell or whoever happened to ship you on the, the free license on the server that they, uh, they've sold you. you know, so don't just make that assumption as you move into the cloud as well. Please think about it if you need anything. We're here to help. We've got, I say, expertise across a wide variety of products. We work with Bytes on a, I would say, almost minutely basis, but certainly a daily basis uh, across a wide range of their clients. And we can absolutely help with recommendations. And it may be absolutely use ASR, use Azure, back up. It, it's perfect for your needs. Or look at some of that other stuff, and then we can go into manage service as well. So trying to take a bit more time. Hopefully that is uh, that a good yeah, thank, thanks for that, Nick. I think um, that that just sort of echoes what me and Chris were saying about coming up with a per workload basis. I think we need to have a look at backup and DR as a strategy on also a, a location base and where your infrastructure and applications actually reside, right? I've, I've, a lot of organizations come to us and they say, look, we've done an assessment with our Microsoft team and Microsoft is saying it's going to cost this much to migrate. And then as your backup plus as your site recovery is going to cost this much. And what I find, not, not trading on Microsoft's toes, but what I find with that is they often don't realize that actually some of that might be retained on premises and some of that might be moving to co-location. Some of that just can't move to the cloud and they've just made the assumption that it can and therefore built almost like pre-canned them a backup strategy using some native tooling that might not be relevant to what they're doing. And I think one, one key thing for me is obviously you guys take care of managed backup for people, i.e., you know, backup is, an operational overhead, making sure that things run and making sure that jobs are good and, and invocating DR to prove that your DR strategy works properly is is time consuming for organizations and time that some of the people on this call probably could be doing more value add things to the business. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, realistically, if you do end up with uh, in a situation where you're using multiple tools, the last thing you want to do is replicate that time overhead, right? So. My mantra is try and use as few tools as possible, but for the tools that you do use, you want to make them as streamlined as possible and maybe, you know, offload that to someone else to do if you need to. I'm not saying what you do is boring and not value add, Nick, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, 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 we are definitely at the... Um... I don't, I don't think you can use sexy in, a, in an IT sense anyway, but we're definitely nowhere near that end of any uh, any IT products, but we are we are really relevant at a specific point in time. And as you say, I've, I've been doing this job for 20 odd years now, and I don't think I've ever met anyone in IT that said, you know what I've got a problem of? I've got too many people and too much time, and I just don't know what to do with them. I don't think that has ever been said in, in any IT director or, or, or CTO. So. Perfect, thanks so much for that. Um, cool, so I, I think we can move on now. Um, we're gonna spend the last, uh, the last session here, unless there's anything else, Nick, to add from that side. Um, yeah, we're going to spend the last the last session now just with a, a little bit of a Q and A RC expert panel session. Um, we've obviously had all the speakers so far. Uh, if oh here they are, they will appear in front of you. Um, I think we're also joined by is Tony there? Um, I think Tony. Yeah. Tony, Tony is Tony is uh, the version of me except for data center. So quite often uh, we work quite closely together whilst discussing hybrid strategies, and obviously that brings VMware into the fold. Um, he's also got one of the best beards in IT, unless anyone on the call fancies challenging him. You can come off camera and, and you can have a beard off, but for now, Tony's got the top. <laughs> so look, guys, thanks for, thanks for everything so far. Um, some of the points raised have been really valuable. I'm hoping a lot of people come away today with some ideas as to avenues to explore. Um, anyone that's been on this call so far, anyone that's spoken, uh, we're more than happy to set up follow-up conversations with you on a one-to-one -one basis if you want us to add a bit more context to your specific situation, if you want us to say, 
you know, um, here, here's what's relevant to you because a lot of things today have been, it depends on your situation, right? So if you want us to understand your situation and, and you know, we can come up with projects, we can come up with cost models, we can come up with things that are nuanced to yourself. So uh, without further ado, let's, let's have a look at some of the questions that are submitted and please do drop them in the chat if you have any. Um, we had some questions submitted beforehand, um, so we can start with some of them. Uh, and the first one was answered perfectly by Dean. Um, does Azure support older operating systems, uh, in particular SQL 2000, Windows 2000, Server 2008, uh, R2 or SQL Server 2008? Um, I suppose you know some of them are supported in Azure, some of them are supported through AVS as well. Um, Chris, do you want to do you want to tackle that first through like Azure Native? What is supported and how far back we can support? Sure. So. Uh... Uh, blanket statement is uh, Microsoft Technologies uh, from 2008 R2 are supported in virtual machines in Azure under the extended support um, uh, period. Uh, so I think there's about another year or so to run on those. Um, varies between Windows Server and, and SQL Server. Um, so those are uh, really good value um, ways of continuing to run uh, those older systems in Azure because you don't have to pay very large sums of money to Microsoft to get those extended support updates for your uh, aging technology. Uh, you can migrate them into Azure relatively easily using the lift and shift and then uh, get ongoing support for another year-ish. Um, as uh, Dean also said, yeah, you can uh, bring those to uh, AVS and run them in virtual machines in the VMware solution and still get those extended support uh, if um, you know, using the Azure native virtual machine technology is not appropriate for whatever reason um, or you want to maintain you know, just uh, everything in, in VMware. It, it, it's a great solution either way. Um, prior to 2008 R2, uh, I think, well, there's no official support. Some older uh, Microsoft technologies can work in the virtual machine, um, but yeah. things won't work effectively. Uh, so for anything older than 2008 R2, the recommendation is generally go down the AVS route because um, yeah. VMware obviously have great support for older technologies. Yeah, Chris, thank you. And, and yeah, so I, I think the delineation uh, that I tend to use with customers is that uh, AVS is governed by the v, the ESX compat OS compatibility matrix, uh, and that compatibility matrix does go a little bit further back, as you quite rightly pointed out. I'd have to double check how far it goes back, but I think Windows Server 2003 is still on there, uh, and we do have customers that still, uh, for uh, well, for good reasons, I guess, uh, still still have it out there. So, so yes, I think you're right. Analyze it on the workload and then use the tools in your kit bag to, de to determine that workload placement uh, based on based on what the requirements of that workload are. As you say, if that workload can be easily migrated, then yeah, uh, there's lots of tools that can help you to get that to Azure Native. Uh, and if it's not appropriate to get to Azure Native, if the VMware OS compatibility matrix covers it, then yes, we can use AVS to, to move that. And we, and we can do that by the live vMotion and no IP address change as well, as long as it's on that compatibility matrix. Thanks. For that. And on, on, I was just going to say on the Linux side of things, uh, basically, the, again, uh, you know, support goes back um, fair. I think uh, Red Hat 6 kind of era, 6.7 is, is the earliest version uh, supported by Microsoft still in native virtual machines. And again, AVS will support older versions of distributions uh, and a, a wider variety of distributions as well. Brilliant, thanks, Chris. Uh, that leads nicely into another question about obviously, you know, uh, you've looked at your infrastructure components, you're trying to build a service map for it. Someone's asked, is it easier to iterate as you move into the cloud or once you're in the cloud? So uh, I always use the analogy. Uh, about building the plane whilst you're flying to the destination or changing the plane around whilst you're flying to the destination. Um, you know, I, I've always been of the belief that once you're in the cloud, it's it's easier to actually, you know, snapshot things, change things around, um, you know, try things out. If it doesn't work, tear it down. If it does work, keep it. Great. 
Um, and I've always been hesitant. Every time I've sat on a plane, I've never gone, oh, that's a nice wing. I wonder what it would look like over there. Uh, get me to the place first. <laughs> get, get, get me to the place yeah. first and then start fiddling about with it. And I, I've just found that that is, you know, that that's probably the, the same message that um, that VMware have here as, as we have all the time. If it's, if it's a time bound exercise where, you know, your DC exit is being driven by something like you need to close down buildings, you need to shift to consumption based model uh, or operation expenditure model, or you need to do those things with um, maybe you don't necessarily have the knowledge internally, uh, your teams don't, um, you know, don't yet understand fully the landscape of Azure to be able to do that. Well, actually, once you're in Azure, it's very easy to then start, you know, once once you've got your hands on the tools to start learning Azure. To learn Azure whilst doing a migration into Azure is uh, risky, difficult, and might end up a little bit more time consuming. Yeah, I, I'd echo that 100%. You know, uh, the more uh, advanced of the R's, so you know, the refactor, re-architect, rebuild, uh, those require much deeper knowledge of us yeah so it's easier to acquire some understanding during the migration uh, a, a lift and shift type migration and then um, you know, iterate forward from there and again this is one of the, the the beauties of doing things in cloud is that it's relatively straightforward and cheap and quick to iterate a little bit at a time um, you know you don't have to juggle uh, infrastructure requirements it's like well if i need to spin up um, you know 100 virtual machines to, to fiddle around with uh, testing something or a bunch of uh, database um, instances. Again, I don't have to plan ahead and go and acquire equipment to go and do that. I can just press a button and five minutes later I've got it, uh, the scale I need it um, and where I need it. So yeah, really much, much simpler and easier and quicker to iterate forward a little bit at a time in Azure, which obviously minimizes risk, minimizes effort and keeps you moving forward a little bit at a time, constantly proving the value to the business of your uh, your technology choices. Just to just to, to add to that, to that, Chris, I think we and United have done that DC extension use case and we've definitely seen that customers are looking at that as almost a kind of toe in the water, if you like, that it's maybe some new, uh, new, new server requirements and rather than build that in the DC, they'll expand that, stretch in, uh, it's kind of low risk, it might be for dev and test workloads, and from them, they'll kind of build out confidence capability and go on to build a kind of business case and, and look at how they can take it further. So definitely we see that kind of iterative, iterative, um, iterative appro approach. Thanks for that, guys. Uh, we've had a another question here. Uh, are all the features available in SQL 2019 on premise available with SQL PaaS services? Um, they're looking at the journey and converting their IaaS into a PaaS solution. Um, I'll be interested to find if that is already running in IaaS in Azure, or if that's something that's running on-prem or, or somewhere else. But just off the bat, uh, Chris, do you want to take that one as well? Happy to. Uh, so thanks very much for the question. Uh, it's um, basically there is not a hundred percent surface area compatibility between the SQL platform services and what you can achieve in a virtual machine, either in Azure or on premise. Uh, however, there are free tooling uh, available from Microsoft uh, that enable you to uh, do a schema check on your existing database and also look at the queries that are being run against that database to establish whether what is there and, and being run against it is possible to uh, run under one of the several versions of a SQL platform service in Azure, and also then gives you a, a, a not quite one click, but uh, a very short way, an easy way of migrating that database uh, into Azure uh, platform service or into a virtual machine in platform service with minimal yeah. downtime. Um, I would say that um, the the main thing that uh, I come across uh, when trying to do a database migration from SQL on premise into SQL platform service is uh, integration services. There's no such thing in the platform service. SQL agent um, that only runs on uh, the managed instance version of the platform service, which is a little bit more costly, um, but has a, a wider surface area of compatibility. But um, generally, if you're just using a database as you know, the, the database service of SQL Server, there's good compatibility. And I, I'd echo that, Chris, and my experience is exactly the same. 
same as you. I think the only thing that used to come up for me, I think you're, you're spot on with the uh, integration services and reporting services. Uh, the other one was the CLR. So I think some some customers sometimes use the CLR on premise that they can't use in in, in in SQL PaaS, but you can, I think, on managed instance. So I think you're absolutely right. Using the DMA, the database migration assistant, it, I find that was a really good tool for me that, that showed me in, in great detail the what I can and can't do. But like you say, if he can't do it directly on SQL PaaS, it would allow you to do it on managed instance. Yeah, I, I suppose to, to hammer home the point about continually iterating in the cloud is if you're migrating to the cloud from an on-premise environment and the database migration assistant notified you that it's not compatible with a platform as a service in Azure, it might not necessarily mean that it's a massive change to make it compatible. It just means that it's not compatible right now. And that's why you should always, when you're building a service map, not only build an initial cloud target, but also look for suitable subsequent cloud targets to actually work towards. And through that, you can identify some low hanging fruit. It might just be a code change. You might just need to replace something like DB mail with you know, a different thing. Um, so you, know, you, you can look at doing those kind of things. Uh, it might be a move from SQL IaaS to SQL MI, and then in the future, a move to SQL PaaS as your applications change and their dependencies change. Um, and that will help you just keep your finger on the pulse to say, look, as we move to IaaS, initially it might appear that it might be just as expensive. Uh, some workloads might actually cost a little bit more to run in the cloud uh, initially, but as we move over time, we're going to be able to gradually change this, which just isn't something that you get in an on-premise world. You don't get the choice to change things and chop things in and out. You know, you, you, you have a three to five year cycle to do that if you're on prem and even longer if you sweat your assets even harder. So just the ability to say, right, that this is something which we're going to improve continually as opposed to, you know, just improve every every few years is massively valuable to a business and something that everyone should be doing when doing a cloud migration. Perfect. Uh, another question just here, it was around um, if someone's operating a hybrid environment, um, let's say they are looking at Azure just for disaster recovery. Uh, should ASR be the right tooling that they should be looking at? Uh, Nick, I'm going to let you answer this one and maybe Tony, you can chime in with your thoughts afterwards because I know we've had a few conversations with customers recently where ASR uh, appeared the most cost effective but wasn't. So Nick, um, if, if you want to take that one first. Yeah, so, so I guess, you know, at a commercial end, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it can look fairly cost effective, but uh, because of the storage types and bits and pieces used, it doesn't necessarily um, end up being the most cost effective. So that's sort of one point at a, at a purely financial level. Um, it's, it's not a foregone conclusion that it will be the cheapest. Um, it also doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily easy to manage at scale as well. So if you're doing a handful of virtual machines or whatever, it's, it's not too much of a problem. Uh, but we've got clients that are running hundreds, three, four, five hundred virtual machines through replication tools. And it, it can be a bit more challenging to run at that scale. And, and it, it does have some, um, I guess, some, some limitations that you want to be aware of. Um, from a support management manageability perspective. Um, so it sort of doesn't really answer the question other than, other than to say, yes, it might be, <laughs> but, but without really knowing a bit more detail, it's certainly not the, you certainly shouldn't just assume because it's an Azure, I'll use ASR. Uh, I think from my point of view, um, it's the fail back is operationally the ASR yeah. falls down. Um, it's a great tool to fail over to Azure. Um, Microsoft would obviously like you to stay in Azure once you're in there. The the <laughs> opportunity to fail back is quite a more difficult process than what it would be with third party tools. Yeah, and you also don't get um, a huge degree. So we mentioned Zerto earlier on, for instance. So I can extend the Zerto, the journaling within Zerto, so the recover time the cover recovery window um up to well 90 days in some instances uh with asr it's sort of fixed so you're going to get a lot more um i guess if you want to fail over something that happened last fail back to that happened last week you talk about ransomware so you know one of the keys how do i fail back to a clean version of my environment there's no point to 
failing back to how my environment was five minutes ago if my environment was not in a good place five minutes ago. So um, there are certainly you know other tools out there that provide more granularity, different abilities to, yeah. to, to do that as well. So th there are certainly some pointers to think. Perfect. Thanks for that. I don't think there's any more questions, um, unless anyone wants to come off mute and and ask one of the experts here now, uh, or drop it in the chat. Feel free. Um, Chris, Chris, just just one question that, that we often get asked that hasn't been asked, so I'll maybe just kind of uh, talk, talk it through. Yeah, anyway. yeah. It's around the kind of uh, cost model and, and TCO. Uh, so, so quite often um, customers look at is this going to be more expensive, particularly to go with with, with ABS or or even as your native. Um, so, so I think for, for me, in terms of kind of getting started, one of the things to look at is really doing that cost model and assessment to really look at what does it cost on prem, what does it cost in, in, in the cloud. So I think that often uncovers um, a, a lot of kind of nuggets in terms of uh, where those where those costs are. So so definitely in the cases that we've done, and I think you mentioned it yourself, Chris, in your slides that moving to Azure can be more cost effective than on prem. Um, so we've definitely got some examples there and uh, be more than happy to, to work uh, with, with anybody in the call that wants to do that with, with Bice uh, to, to look at those, those kind of cost models as a kind of, as a kind of precursor to this. Yeah, and I, I, I think obviously we've worked with you uh, to help some of our customers build business cases based on the TCO of uh, not only just the infrastructure, right? We've looked at operational overheads, we've looked at learning capabilities and stuff like that. and actually that really helps an organization go okay well look we're looking at our migration option and this is what we're sponsoring to the borders you know we've, we've thought about this we've thought about staff costs we've thought about data center costs we've thought about all of those elements because that's what they're going to get asked right so we're more than happy to do that for, for anything that we've spoken about on this call if someone wants to uh do some models of how their backup and dr would look like in different scenarios if someone would like to look at how much it would cost to uh, to migrate into azure and you know, refactor into Azure or anything that we've spoken about today, please do uh, let us know. We're more than happy to sit down in a sort of no obligation session just to run those things past you and help you out uh, in building those business cases. Perfect. Well, you should be, um, you should have a poll up on your screen just in case you're interested in any of those workshops that I just spoke about. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you could answer those. Um, you'll get a uh, follow up from somebody, uh, somebody here uh, and we'll be able to run through them uh, and basically figure out what's best to, uh, to, to help you out with and, and what really you're looking for and what area of technology we've covered today that's most interesting to you. Please do, please do fill that out if you can. Perfect, a lot of people want some more information. Um, Anything specific, drop it in the chat or, or, or just send us an email uh, and we'll be able to send some stuff over. Um, just a note, someone asked if this is being recorded. Yes, it is being recorded. It will be made available to you uh, later on today or tomorrow maybe, uh, but it is being recorded. It will be, a link will be sent out to you uh, just covering some of the stuff that we've spoken about today. But if that's everything, uh, thank you so much to everybody who's attended. Uh, thank you, Andy, Dean, Nick, Tony and Chris. Uh, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, and thank you once again. Look forward to hearing from you soon. Great. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you.